I'm not a grammar Nazi. I usually don't even teach grammar and mechanics in my first semester composition classes because I believe that there are other more fundamental things, more basic parts of the writing process that need to be taught to freshmen entering college and studying here for the first time. I do, though, teach grammar a lot in my upper division composition classes and especially in business writing because it's in the business world that the consequences for bad grammar are the most severe. It's in the business world that people will judge you and your ideas and your arguments and the things you're trying to propose based on a lot of different factors, some of which are quite superficial. Bad grammar has consequences and making mistakes that people recognize as mistakes makes it very difficult for you to craft effective communications. So what we're going to do in this podcast in the next few minutes are just look at some of the most common errors that people make in business writing and then I'm going to have you do some exercises and some revisions to help you reinforce these ideas and and I want you to just keep thinking about how you're presenting yourself to your audiences and how the the agreed upon rules of correctness are going to play a part in that presentation. Here's a quick list of the th six things we'll be talking about in this podcast, the, the six grammatical errors. Subject-verb agreement, inconsistent case, dangling modifiers, misplaced modifiers, faulty parallelism, and faulty predication. We're going to go over individually and, and discuss what each of these means. But first, I want to read an example, a few examples of sentences and paragraphs that contain all of these errors. Okay, here's a paragraph that manages to get every one of these errors in it. See if you can detect why. The letter arrives last week in a big white envelope with blue letters. I thought it looked official. It was from Johnson Industries. Shannon and me had been waiting for the letter for a week. The company sends letters like this one when hiring often. Nervous, I opened it and found three things. A letter offering a job, a brochure describing company benefits, and a list of job duties in a memo. I was thrilled. My employment goals would begin immediately. Now let's look at how this paragraph would sound if all of the errors were corrected. You might want to look at this once or twice, replay this part of the podcast to, to see the difference, to see the contrast. The letter arrived last week in a big white envelope with blue letters that looked official. It was from Johnson Industries. Shannon and I had been waiting for the letter for a week. The company often sends letters like this one when hiring. Nervous, I opened it and found three things, a letter offering a job, a brochure describing company benefits, and a memo listing job duties. I was thrilled. Implementing my employment goals could begin immediately. Okay, let's break each one of these errors down and talk about why it is an error and how we can correct it. First of them, the letter arrived last week is a pretty clear violation of the rule that verbs should agree with their subjects in tense and in number. The letter arrives is a present tense verb, but last week is an inherently past tense situation. So it should say either the letter arrived last week or perhaps the letter arrives today. But to, to put something that clearly occurred in the past in the present tense violates the, the requirement for agreement. Uh, most people know this instinctively. Most people understand that you don't say um, he are here. You don't mix a, a subject that is singular with a verb that is plural. But there are some situations that can get in our way. First of these occurs when there are a lot of words in between the subject and the verb, as in the first example here. The students who gave me the papers that I had to spend all night grading in my apartment before I could go out with my girlfriend who was having a birthday <sighs> were from Nebraska. Between students and were, there's a lot of real estate, and it's very easy to pick one of these other s nouns in there and to have it in your mind as the subject and to coordinate the verb with the wrong subject and 
and often the more words between the subject and the verb, the more likely we are to commit errors in agreement. A second set of errors occurs when we use words like everyone and no one or nobody or each or each one, words that are singular but that kind of seem like they ought to be plural. Everyone is a singular subject, but when we say everyone in the room, we're thinking of more than one person. So it's very easy to say everyone ate their dinner rather than everyone ate his or her dinner the his or her being uh, a way to avoid the sexist assumption that everybody is a him or a her, uh, which is a, a convention that is gaining in popularity and is usually the way that that is handled in edited prose. A third situation occurs when you have prepositional phrases and the object of the prepositional phrase has a different number than the subject of the sentence. So when I say the high price of cars and food uh, price is singular, but cars and food are plural because this is, this is two different things. It's a compound subject. So the high price of cars and food is responsible for the current recession is correct. But because cars and food is plural and that occurs between the subject and the verb, it's easy to say the high price of cars and food are responsible. And finally, errors can occur with compound subjects, which are plural, even if if the last one is singular, as in, the president of the company and his secretary are coming to dinner tonight, rather than the president of the company and his secretary is coming to dinner tonight, uh, sometimes people, people uh, correlate the verb to the second of the compound subjects and, and don't consider the, the plurality of both of the compound or both or more of the compound subjects. So those are just a few situations in which our, our fairly consistent intuitive understanding of subject-verb agreement can be tricked by the way that a sentence is phrased. Just as subjects must agree with their verbs, pronouns have to agree with their reference, the nouns that they are standing in place of. And sometimes this can be tricky. There are several different cases of pronouns. There are possessive pronouns, his and hers and its, when somebody is owning something or something is, is being considered part of something. Uh, there are reflexive pronouns, such as myself, himself, herself. But the two that usually end up causing confusion are the nominative and the objective pronouns. Nominative are subject pronouns, uh, I, he, she, they. Uh, objective pronouns are the pronouns that are usually in the direct object position. Me, him, her, them. You is easy because you is the same in both the nominative and the objective cases. But we usually make mistakes with compound pronouns. Me and my brother went to the store instead of my brother and I went to the store. Well, you would never say me went to the store, uh, but you would be more likely, most people are more likely to say me and my brother went to the store uh, because the second noun in there takes, takes away some of the closeness of the pronoun to the rest of the sentence. So it, it, it just sounds less wrong to say me and my brother went to the store than me went to the store. But it's just as incorrect. Uh, she gave the book to he and I. A lot of times, because we've been told over and over again, say, my brother and I went to the store, which is correct, when we have a similar construction that is an object of a sentence, we overcorrect and we say, she gave the book to he and I. You would never say, she gave the book to he. But for some reason, again, when you compound uh, a pronoun or several pronouns or a pronoun with another word, it makes more sense to make these kinds of case errors. Just something to be aware of. Look carefully at this next sentence from the paragraph that we read in the beginning. In a big white envelope with blue letters, I thought it looked official. If you look carefully there, you'll notice that there's no noun. The words in red, a big white envelope with the blue letters, don't modify anything that is in the sentence. What they modify is the noun, the letter. We know that from other sentences in the paragraph, but that noun does not appear anywhere in this sentence. So the way that it reads grammatically, I, or the speaker, 
is in a big white envelope with blue letters, which we know is not true. This is a dangling modifier. It's a phrase that modifies a noun that's not present in the sentence. Usually you can kind of figure out what the author means if you read around the other sentences, uh, but sometimes the results can be quite humorous. Look at the next two sentences and, and see if you can find or deduce the noun that the modifying phrase is supposed to be modifying. After waking up, a good cup of coffee really hits the spot. Now the noun is me, after I wake up, but that's not stated anywhere, so it sounds like the cup of coffee woke up. Uh, which, which it didn't. Or look at the next one. Flying over the African landscape, the elephant herd looked magnificent. Again, flying over the African landscape is a modifying phrase. It's a modifier. It modifies I or we or whoever's in the airplane doing that. But that, that modified noun does not appear anywhere in the sentence. So the only thing that can be flying are the elephants. Sometimes the modifying phrase is modifying something that is in the sentence, but isn't in the right place in the sentence. There are other nouns closer to the modifying phrase that could be modified, grammatically at least, by the phrase. This is called a misplaced modifier. You've probably, at some point in your life, seen a sign like the one below here, slow children playing, and chuckled to yourself, and wondered where the fast children are, because... Uh, the, the modifier slow can modify children, or it can modify what you should do. You should go slow because there are children playing. Um, look at the sentence from the, the sample. The company sends letters like this one when hiring often. Well, the often needs to be closer to sends because that's what it's modifying. The company often sends letters like this one because... Sometimes companies are hiring often, and it makes a certain kind of grammatical sense to read, read the wrong word as being modified by often. Um, look at the next two sentences, and again, a lot of jokes are based on this kind of, of uh, dangling or misplaced modifier. Uh, there's a famous line from Mary Poppins, if any of you remember Mary Poppins, where they say when they're up on the ceiling laughing, 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 I once had a friend with a wooden leg named Smith. What's the name of the other leg? Bum, bum. But that's, that's a misplaced modifier, because the wooden leg isn't named Smith, the friend is named Smith. But because wooden leg comes in between friend and Smith, it makes a, a certain grammatical sense to apply the modifier to wooden leg. Or here's one, covered with hot melted cheese, we ate the pizza. Of course, applying that we are covered with hot melted cheese because the, the word we is closer to the modifying phrase than the word pizza, which it actually modifies. Okay, there's two more to go, and I'm going to talk fast because this is getting to be a long podcast, and all the research says that students today don't like long podcasts. So look at the sample sentence here, uh, and this is an example of faulty parallelism. Nervous, I opened it and found three things. A letter offering a job, a brochure describing company benefits, and a list of job duties in a memo. You notice how the first two are parallel grammatically and logically to each other. A letter, ba -ba -ba -ba. a brochure, ba -ba -ba -ba. but the third one has the parallel element, memo, at the end of the phrase instead of the beginning, and a list of job duties in a memo. The way to make these elements parallel is to say uh, a letter, a brochure, and a memo, so that each of the elements that's coordinated by a comma has the same grammatical and logical structure. One more example here on the right is just look at this list here. This could be a PowerPoint or it could be part of a sentence. In the second month of your internship, you will learn how to resolve customer complaints. Supervision of desk staff, interns will help plan store displays. Each of the parts of speech there that begins the, the coordinated phrases is a different part of speech. Uh, you need to coordinate it all together so that, that the coordinated elements. The elements that are considered parallel within the sentence are both grammatically and logically parallel. In the second month of your internship, you will learn how to resolve customer complaints, supervise desk staff, plan store displays. 
learn, supervise, plan are all strong verbs. Learn is a verb, supervision is a noun, interns is also a noun. So those are three completely different logical and grammatical structures. You need to get them parallel or else you are committing the horrid fallacy of faulty parallelism. And finally, we come to faulty predication, which is one of the most difficult of all of these errors to understand. But basically, faulty predication means that your subject and your verb don't go together logically as subject and verb, even if they do go together grammatically. Look at the sentence from the example, my employment goals would begin immediately. Well, no, they won't, because goals can't begin. Uh, you will begin your employment immediately, but your goals can't begin anything because goals aren't the kinds of things that can begin anything. So that's just the use of a subject with a verb where the subject can't actually perform the action that the verb is describing the subject as, as performing. Probably the two most common kinds of faulty parallelism occur with the constructions in the examples here on the right. The reason is because the SEC has new rules. A reason cannot be because. Because is the beginning of an adverb clause. Reason is a noun. An adverb can't be linked by a linking verb to a noun because adverbs don't modify nouns. The reason is that the SEC has new rules. Or insider trading is when. The is when construction. Insider trading is when somebody with privileged knowledge about a company uses that knowledge to buy or sell stocks. Insider trading can't be when because is cannot link a noun to an adverb or an adverb phrase. It has to link it to either an adjective or to another noun. Insider trading occurs when. It can occur when because occur is not a linking verb. Look at some other examples in your book of faulty predication. It actually can be a very serious problem, but again, the best way to explain it is when, when subjects can't do what the verbs and the modifiers say that they can do uh, because, because it it's simply creates either an illogical or an ungrammatical connection between subject and verb. And that is the end of this part of the podcast. The next one, which uh, is also part of the same chapter of your book, the next thing we're going to look at is the comma and all of the various mistakes that we can make in where and how we place commas in our texts.